Now, jot down these five key ideas. Here's number one, work on your personal philosophy. The first thing you start changing is what? Your philosophy. You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information. Gather new knowledge, make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change. Your relationship with your family will change. Your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. I'm telling you, income, promotions, all of it will change. If you will change, it'll all change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope they'll straighten it out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, wishing for the wind to change in your favor, we call naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25 and it revolutionized my whole life. My mentor said, Mr. Owen, you've been working six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. He said, couldn't we go over the last six years and find out where your errors in judgment were? And couldn't we correct those and invest that correction in the next six years? I said, I guess we could. That's how I went from pennies to four. Incredible. Only humans can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. Right? If you used up all the nourishment around you, couldn't move, then you would die. But that's not true. So however little what much you want to change, that's up to you. But see, if there's a class and you don't take it and a skill and you don't learn it and a discipline and you don't try it. And if there's a possibility and you don't explore it, then who are we going to blame? Nobody but yourself. You know, we put some of the valuable things on the high shelf so you can't get to them until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you got to stand on the book you read. Every book you read, you get to stand a little higher so you can get the things on the higher shelf. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They got to know. They just read, 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 read. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger, more decisive? Be a speaker, be a leader. Have a better effect on other people. Develop your personality. Did you know there's books on that? And people don't read them? How would you explain that? And they can read. Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day. Don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. And also remember to properly feed the mind. You must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Mr. Shof got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. Shelf recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now I had a Bible, that's 66 books. So that was a pretty good start. But the first book Mr. Shelf told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, 
It's a great one to add to your library. I read it several dozen times. Shelf said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shope, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. Here's the next one, attitude. Attitude. It is our attitude toward life which will determine life's attitude toward us. Now let's talk about the attitudes of people who are successful. Successful people come in all shapes and sizes and in widely varying degrees of intelligence, background, and so on. But they all have one thing in common. They expect more good out of life than bad. They expect to succeed more than they fail. If you want something worthwhile, take the attitude that there are a lot more reasons why you can have it than there are that you cannot and set out to earn it. Go after it, work at it, ask for it, and nine times out of ten, you'll get it. Now, let me tell you of a little test you can make which will prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that a good attitude can change a person's life as dramatically as walking from a darkened room into the bright, clear light of day. So here's the test. For the next 30 days, act toward the world, everything and everyone with whom you come in contact, with the attitude which represents the kind of results you want to achieve. That is, if the result you want is more success in what you're doing, act as though you are already in possession of the success you seek. If you want others to treat you with admiration and respect, treat others with admiration and respect first. Have you ever stopped to think of this? Every human being on earth is the most important human being on earth as far as he or she is concerned. You may never get anyone to admit it, but it's a fact. So for the next 30 days, treat every person with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth, remembering as you do so that as far as that person is concerned, he is. Now the reason I say treat everyone in this fashion is mainly because this is the way human beings ought to treat each other and because it will help you form a habit that will bring you amazing and delightful results for the rest of your life. Have you ever noticed that the higher you go in any organization of value, the nicer the people seem to become? You see, the bigger the person, the easier it is to talk to him, to get along with him, to do business with him. Do you know why? It's because he's got a good attitude, and people with the best attitudes just naturally gravitate toward the top. So for 30 days, act toward others and the world at large in exactly the same manner you want the world and others to act toward you. Treat your wife or husband as the person he or she really is, the most important person in your life. And the same with the children. Carry out into the world each morning for 30 days the kind of attitude you would have if you were the most successful human being on earth. And notice how it quickly develops into an habitual attitude. When a person does this, he should realize he has already placed himself on the road to what he seeks. He is right now in the top 5% of the people in this or any other country. He has prepared the ground and planted the seed. He has made of himself a magnet, an embodiment of that which he seeks. Before metal can be cast into a desired shape, the mold, the expectant receptacle, must first be fashioned. Before a building can be erected, the excavation must be made and the foundation laid. And before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs as would the person he wishes to become. He is then actually that person, and the things that person would have and do will naturally come to him. Almost immediately, a change will be noticed. Irritations that used to frustrate and annoy disappear. When some less informed individual gives you a bad time, stay on the track. When someone cuts in front of you with his car or acts in any other manner that shows his ignorance and lack of courtesy, don't permit yourself to drop to his level. Pity him, for that's what he really deserves. That's the very group a person doesn't want to belong to. And if he acts like them, well, let's face it, he belongs with them. 
There's nothing in the world that men, women, and children want and need more than the feeling that they're important, that they're needed and respected. They will give their love, their affection, their respect, and their business to the person who fills this need. So the magic word is attitude. And in summing up, a few points to keep in mind. One, it is our attitude at the beginning of a task which more than anything else will affect its successful outcome. Two, it is our attitude toward life which determines life's attitude toward us. Three, we are interdependent. It is impossible to succeed without others. And it is our attitude toward others which will determine their attitude toward us. Four, before a person can achieve the kind of life he wants, he must become that kind of individual. He must think, act, talk, walk, and conduct himself in all of his affairs as would the person he wishes to become. Five, the higher you go in any organization of value, the better will be the attitude you'll find. Six, your mind can hold only one thought at a time, and since there's nothing at all to be gained by being negative, be positive. Seven, the deepest craving of human beings is to be needed, to feel important, to be appreciated. Give it to them, and they'll return it to you. Eight, look for the best in new ideas. As someone said, I've never met a person I couldn't learn something from. Nine, don't waste valuable time broadcasting personal problems. It probably won't help you. It cannot help others. 10. Don't talk about your health unless it's good. 11. Radiate the attitude of well-being, of confidence, of a person who knows where he's going. This will inspire those around you, and you'll find good things will begin happening to you. And 12. Lastly, for the next 30 days, treat everyone with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. If you'll do this for 30 days, you'll do it for the rest of your life. Now here's the third of the five ideas, number three, and it's called lifestyle. Because the essence of life is not a Ferrari or a bank account. It's not a million dollars. Here's the essence of life. Learning to live a good life. <laughs> Don't just learn how to earn, learn how to live. Mr. Shove taught me lifestyle in those early days, starting with small amounts. He said, Imagine that you're getting your shoes shined, and the shoe shine boy has done a fabulous job. So you pay him for the shine. Now you consider from the change in your hand what kind of tip to give him. And the question pops into your mind, shall I give him one quarter or two quarters for my neat shine? Mr. Shelf said, if two amounts for a tip ever come to your mind, always go for the higher amount. I said, what difference would that make? one quarter or two quarters. He said, all the difference in the world. If you said, well, I'll just give him one quarter, that will affect you for the rest of the day. You will start feeling bad. Sure enough, in the middle of the day, you will look down at your great shoe shine and say, I've got to be cheap, one lousy quarter. That will affect you. However, if you go for two quarters, Shof said, you can't believe the feeling you can buy for another quarter. That's lifestyle. So develop your lifestyle a little more. Your style of seeing, giving, sharing, enjoying. It's not the amount that counts, but the experience of choosing to live with style. I remember saying to Mr. Schof one time, if I had more money, I would be happy. And he gave me some of the better words of wisdom that he said to me, Mr. Rohn, the key to happiness is not more. Happiness is an art to be studied and practiced. He said, more money will only make you more of what you already are. If you're inclined to be unhappy, if you get a lot of money, you will be miserable. More money will only make you more. More money will only amplify. If you're inclined to be mean and you get a lot of money, you will be a terror. If you are inclined to drink a little too much, when you get a lot of money, you can now become a drunk because you can drink everything. So style is not more. Style is an art. Here's something else to think about. Did you ever hear where the expression tip came from? As in tipping the waiter or waitress in a restaurant. Mr. Shove taught me that it began as a symbol for the phrase to ensure promptness. Now Shof said, if a tip is to ensure promptness, when should you give it? Answer, up front. See, I didn't know that. 
I said, no, you have lunch, and if you get good service, you leave a good tip. If you get lousy service, no tip. And he said to me, no, no, Mr. Rohn. Sophisticated people don't take a chance on good service. They ensure good service by giving the money up front. I said, wow, what a way to live. I had never thought of that. So the next time you have someone special to take to lunch, call the waitress over, arm around the shoulders and say, here's $5. Would you take good care of me and my friend? Shof said, you won't believe what happens. They do what's known as hover. They hover around your table. Same money, different style. The next one is activity. Now here's an important question. What is your philosophy about activity? What about hard work? What about long hours? What about full days? If you're doing something, how hard should you go at it? How much time should you put in? Everybody has to develop their philosophy about activity. Because your philosophy of activity will affect the rest of your life. Not to think so is naive. I've got a good clue on rest. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. If you rest too long, the weeds take the garden in the summer. So you can't rest too long. Life doesn't stand still. And the threat of life will start overwhelming the values of life if you just let it go. So we've all got to have a philosophy about activity. Let me give you one of the best I know. Here's what it says. An ancient phrase says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. That's a philosophy. You say, well, I'm getting by with half my might. Well, okay, but you've got to decide on your own personal philosophy of activity. Now, this philosophy says, do it with all your might. Do you think there's any value or virtue in that? Well, I don't know. You've got to decide. You've got to weigh this out, right? You've got to evaluate it for yourself and put it on your own mental scales, and you've got to come up with your own answers. How hard should you work? I'm teaching kids now the ant philosophy, the ant philosophy. An ancient story says everybody should study ants, especially lazy people. The ant philosophy. Let me give it to you. It's very brief. Number one, ants never quit. Good philosophy. If they're headed somewhere, you try to stop them, they'll look for another way. They'll climb over. They'll climb under. They'll climb around. They keep looking for another way. What a neat philosophy. Never quit looking for a way to get where you're supposed to go. Number two, ants think winter all summer. That's an important philosophy. You can't be so naive as to think summer all summer. You say, well, isn't it nice? You can't think nice when it's nice. We will call you naive. In the summer, you got to think storm. You got to think rock. You can't think sand and sun. Number three, ants think summer all winter. That's so important. I'm sure all winter long ants say, this won't last long, we'll soon be out of here. What a neat philosophy, what a neat attitude. This won't last long. We'll soon be out of here. First warm day, the ants are out. First warm day, they're out. They can't wait to get out. What a neat philosophy. Can't wait to get at it. We teach in leadership skills. Average people look forward to getting off. Successful people look forward to getting on with it. The guy doesn't want off, he wants on. And that's what starts to transform his life into the doing, into the activity. Now here's the last of the ant philosophy. How much will an ant gather during the summer to prepare for the winter? Answer, all he possibly can. What an incredible philosophy, the all you possibly can philosophy. A group of psychiatrists invited me to come and lecture in Los Angeles. I never graduated from college, but they wanted to hear my story, so I go talk to the psychiatrist. Then in the middle of my talk, I had the audacity to say, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what I think most messes with the mind. They said, what do you think most messes with the mind? I said, I think it is simply doing less than you can messes with the mind. It causes all kinds of psychic damage, I think. Simply being less than you can be, doing less than you could do, trying less than you could try, doing it with less enthusiasm than you could. I think it somehow damages the mind. It damages our self-image. Because here's what I've discovered happens. The minute you turn this around and start extending yourself, it isn't the value you get from extending yourself that's the greatest value. It's how you feel about yourself that's the greatest value.
Because see, it's not what we get that makes us valuable. It's what we become. And part of becoming is to see what all you can become. See what all you can do. See how much you can earn, how much you can share, how much you can start, how far you can reach, how far you can extend your influence. Now here's number five. Measure progress. Because if you're gonna play the great drama game of life, the key is to keep measuring progress to see how you're doing. How's your health doing? How's your income doing? How are your investments doing? If you're building a house, how is it coming along? What's going on? Measuring progress. That's what we call the name of the game. Here's how we teach it to our children. You must make measurable progress in reasonable time. Now we must be...